Subscribers to The Australian hear episodes first and get access to all Shari's work on this topic, as well as unrivaled news, politics, investigations, sport and culture. Go to theaustralian.com.au slash Wuhan to find out more. I'm Shari Markson, and I've spent most of the past two years investigating the origins of COVID-19. 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 The Chinese city of Wuhan is under quarantine as the outbreak of the coronavirus worsens. The federal government has raised its travel advice for the Chinese provinces to Wuhan and Huabei to level four. This is the front line of the epidemic in Wuhan, and it is bleak. I'm declaring a public health emergency of international concern over the global outbreak of novel coronavirus. What really happened in Wuhan? John Ratcliffe was appointed the United States Director of National Intelligence in May 2020. In this role, he oversaw the 18 intelligence agencies that form the intelligence community, including the CIA, the FBI and the Department of Homeland Security. COVID-19 was already raging by the time he took the job and Ratcliffe was determined to find out where it had come from. When you started as Director of National Intelligence, you said the agencies would have a laser-like focus on finding the origins of the virus in Wuhan. Did you find the answers you were looking for? I think we did a really good job uh, once I came into uh, into the position of looking deeper and harder because so much had happened. I was looking at at the issue of the Ovid, the origins of COVID from the perspective of a, of a member of Congress, albeit on the Intelligence Committee, but a member of Congress who had oversight of the of the intelligence community. And so, as as you know, as the director of national intelligence, it gave me an inside look. And I really wanted to see what we had done, what uh, intelligence we had already collected. But we set out to get more intelligence, and we were able to do that. And some of that has been declassified. When did the intelligence community start to take quite seriously the hypothesis that this virus might have originated in a Wuhan laboratory? Well, it was really when I came in as the director of national intelligence, and and, and here's why, Sherry, is uh, as I was going through the confirmation process, again, as a, as a I had a perspective as a member of Congress, um, but I watched what was happening in the public domain, and I listened to folks like uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci, who who was and still is the the, the head of the uh, Infec- Infectious Disease Institute, and he said something in. Uh, in April and May before I was confirmed. And what he said was that the mutations of the virus were totally consistent with a jump from animals to humans. And when I became the director of national intelligence, I wanted to know if that was true and see if our intelligence reflected that. And what I found was that there wasn't any intelligence that supported that, nor was there any scientific data that we could find. And so that was really the first um, mission that I gave the intelligence community is is there anything that backs up that statement? Because people are really deferring to the scientific community. And what I'm seeing initially from our intelligence uh, indicates that there's more to the Wuhan Institute of Virology as the source of this leak than anyone's giving attention or credit to. There's nothing linking this virus uh, to the natural world. So all of that was inconsistent with what Dr. Fauci had said. And when you balance that, Sherry, against what's on the other side of the equation, the the, the data and the intelligence that we had tying what happened in Wuhan to the Wuhan Institute of Virology, it's why folks like myself and um, Secretary Pompeo and National Security Advisor Robert O'Brien and others that were, were looking at our intelligence were really, wow, um, we need to go deeper here. And this really looks like the Chinese Communist Party uh, played a role at the Wuhan Institute in Virology in the origins of this. And, and it really went from, you know, people saying that it was just a conspiracy theory, that there was no basis to not just a possibility, but a probability. And I think most folks now agree with me that it's as close to a certainty as we may ever get. What to you are the most compelling pieces of evidence to support the theory that this virus originated in the Wuhan Institute of Virology? Well, there's really, uh, have you got a half an hour? 
<laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> there, there's so much um, that, again, really ties the, the origins of, of the Wuhan virus to the Wuhan Institute of Virology. And so, you know, after the election, and Mike Pompeo and I had a lot of conversations about what we could put out and what we should put out, and we didn't want it to, to influence the, the outcome of the election, and so we did it in January as we were leaving office, and we, we really carefully talked over and over again about protecting our sources and methods into how we get intelligence into the uh, Chinese Communist Party and protecting that. But we really wanted people to see some of the things that we were seeing. So the, so the State Department fact sheet that we put out in January of, 20, uh, of January of 2021 really, I think, contains the most compelling evidence that, that we had, which showed, contrary to what a lot of scientists were saying, was that there was research, gain-of-function research, going on at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Uh, the Dr. Jing Li um, and others were um, not only experimenting with bat coronaviruses, but those that were 96.2% identical to the, to the virus that um, ultimately infected the first victims. And we also revealed the um, involvement of the Chinese military in the Wuhan Institute of Virology was something that a lot of folks had denied. Um, so it was those kinds of things um, that uh, I think are really uh, compelling pieces of evidence but, but also on top of that, in, in addition to the intelligence that we had, it was how China and the Chinese Communist Party reacted to the Wuhan Institute of Virology um, as, a, as a theory. And um, it was the things that the Chinese Communist Party did. Um, in other words, Sherry, if there was really no blame here, if this was really just some naturally occurring virus because someone ate a bat from a wet market, China wouldn't have done the things that they did. The Chinese Communist Party would not have shut down Wuhan. They would not have silenced doctors and scientists and journalists and disappeared some of them. They would not have refused to allow an honest investigation into the Wuhan Institute of Virology and access to that. They would not have engaged in a propaganda campaign to blame others, including the United States, for the virus. All of those things were only necessary because they pointed the finger of blame at the Chinese Communist Party. And so those actions would really have been unnecessary if this was a naturally occurring virus. They would have said simply, hey, we've got a problem. Come help us solve it. There, there's really no other explanation for what they did. So when you couple that with you know, the research that was happening with bats that aren't consistent with, um, with the Wuhan area, the, the um, close identity to the, to the virus itself, to the actions of the Chinese Communist Party, the military involvement, all of those things. It's not just a theory. It's uh, at some point in time you have to say, you know, this is what happened. And do you think we're at that point? Do you think we can confidently say it came from a laboratory? I do. Well, listen, the, the people that had access to uh, the most access to the most intelligence, including myself and Secretary Pompeo, are telling you that the most likely origin of, of COVID-19, of the Wuhan virus, was what happened, was a lab leak at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Also, the top infectious disease expert in the country, Robert Redfield, as the head of the CDC, tells you his opinion is the same. Dr. Giroir, who, uh, Brett Giroir, who was on the Coronavirus Task Force, an infectious disease specialist here in the United States, will tell you the same. So all of the people that had access to the most data, the most intelligence, uh, you know, will all tell you the same thing, that this is really most likely what happened. And it's more than just a possibility. It's certainly a probability, and it's probably a certainty. One of the major pieces of intelligence that Ratcliffe decided to declassify led the trail of the outbreak back to the Wuhan Institute of Virology. It indicated that a handful of workers at the Wuhan Institute fell sick and were hospitalised with COVID-like symptoms. Officials like Pompeo have told me they believe this was the first cluster of the pandemic and it coincided with other unusual activity at the Wuhan Institute of Virology that taken together strongly suggests there was an accident. Look, let's look at that window for an outbreak. To me, it really starts on September 12, 2019. That was the date the virus database administered by Shi Zheng Li was suddenly taken offline, disappeared. On that same date, I've discovered there was a tender for an air incineration 
service, an air incineration upgrade that tender was issued. How significant are those two things in September 2019? And does that indicate to you that that was when the Wuhan Institute of Virology might have realized they had a problem? Well, I think those are factors that are that are in the public domain that people can look at. Um, from an intelligence standpoint, um, as far as I know, nothing's been declassified with respect to our intelligence, whether or not those things happened. Really, what I can say is what Mike Pompeo and I put out is, you know, people became sick at the lab in October and uh, with symptoms that became entirely consistent with what uh, most people have experienced around the world from COVID-19. And so from an intelligence community standpoint, as we looked at that, it's really one of the most compelling things, um, you know, as, as I look back and one of the things that we wanted to make sure that we put out because we were afraid it might not never get out into the public domain and to reporters like you who could, you know, follow up on that. That is such an important piece of information that Wuhan Institute of Virology scientists fell sick October 2019 with COVID-like symptoms. China has tried to, well, firstly, they've denied it, but they've also tried to paint it as it was, you know, it was not a big deal. One of the WHO investigators, Marion Koopmans, said it, it was just one or two that it was sick. It was just like a cold. How convinced are you that they had COVID rather than the flu? Um, based on, without getting into the details of what I've seen, but based on what I've seen, I'm as close to certain as you can get. Um, and in fact, you know, part of the reason we put that information out the way we did, Sherry, was so that folks could independently confirm what we were saying. And as you know, some reporters have, have confirmed that those patients were in the ICU and the symptoms that they had uh, and when they had those symptoms. And, uh, and so it's entirely, again, really backs up what, what we're saying and what we were putting out there. So it's very compelling. Um, there's really no doubt in my mind that folks that were working in and around the Wuhan Institute of Virology were the first victims of the COVID-19 Wuhan virus. Did they survive, those three workers who got sick? Uh, I don't know all of the details uh, about, uh, you know, every single person that we know that the intelligence community had information on. Uh, what I can say is that as, as from the intelligence uh, perspective is we know that some of the people that were most involved um, either infected or um, reporting on or whistleblowing on or trying to get answers and, and uh, journalists report on um, have been difficult to track down later, at least from my time there, um, and so the, difficult to find, difficult to track, difficult to get additional information. Um, and so, you know, I think that's consistent with what the Chinese Communist Party does. Why, how, you know, the status of those individuals and why they've disappeared, I really can't comment on that. And in some cases, I don't know the answer. Uh, even if I did, I wouldn't comment on it. One of those people who was reported to have disappeared was Huan Yang Lin. Is she one of, is she one of the ones that we believe fell sick with COVID-19? Uh, and I don't, I don't know uh, her status, um, but, uh, you know, you, the information that you're talking about that's out in the public domain is consistent with what I've seen and what I'm familiar with. The father of the Chinese democracy movement, China's most famous defector, Wei Jingsheng, told me that he first learned that there was a virus in Wuhan during the time of the military games in October 2019. Uh, he told me that he did alert aspects of the intelligence community in the United States that this was happening. Do you know if his warning was taken seriously? I don't know. I don't have specific um, intelligence, and I wouldn't share it if I did because it likely has not been declassified. But, but again, what I, what I can and will say is that uh, we knew there was some sort of an outbreak or problem in late 2019. The intelligence community did. And I think that you know, uh, the intelligence community, I think, really did a, um, an appropriate job at the time of, of, of gathering and drilling down on intelligence as it was. The, the, the one sort of concern that I had when I came in was, were they giving too much credit to the scientific community and not focused as much um, on what the intelligence was saying? And that was a struggle, at least within the U.S. intelligence community that we were having. I'm sure that 
um, other democracies and, and governments were, were having the same because they, as you know, have intelligence as well. Um, but unfortunately, folks like Dr. Fauci and Peter Daszak and other you know, scientists in the international community were giving us information that was simply not true. And it was when we compared those statements to intelligence that we had and, and they couldn't be reconciled that many of us said, we've really, this is, this all points back to the Wuhan Institute of Virology and China um, is a proximate cause of what's happening around the world um, and, and really um, made this much worse. It could have been contained as an outbreak and it's become a worldwide pandemic because China's, you know, actions to cover this up. Absolutely. And as a result, we've seen millions and millions of people die. I'm going to come back to the fact that the intelligence community was aware there was an unusual virus spreading in Wuhan in late 2019, uh, possibly because of warnings from people like Wei Jingsheng, did that mean that the US had the ability to gather that extra intelligence, get the overhead or the signals data that was needed? Well, I can't betray you know, any of the confidences that, that, that how the intelligence community gathers information against the Chinese Communist Party, and that that's why we were so careful about, you know, um, protecting sources and methods. Looking at it when I came in as the DNI, you know, I, as I look back at it, I didn't see a problem with how the U.S. intelligence community um, responded to what they were seeing. It was appropriate and, and in light of what they were being told and what was being represented to them. And it wasn't until later that we had enough intelligence when you compared it to what some of the things, that not just Chinese Communist Party officials were saying, but World Health Organization officials and some of the folks that you mentioned that simply didn't match up with some of the intelligence that, that we were collecting. Um, that's really where, um, you know, again, the focus shifted to the Wuhan Institute of Virology. I pressed Ratcliffe on what the intel community knew in late 2019 about the virus circulating. He wasn't the director of national intelligence at that time, but he says there was plenty of evidence that pointed to an outbreak in Wuhan. So looking back at it, you know, in late uh, 2019, we have intelligence from both, you know, human intelligence sources and signals intelligence sources and other intelligence sources that, that were telling us that, that there was some sort of a problem in, in Wuhan. Good evening and welcome to the show. I'm Shari Markson. A decorated military scientist, Zhu Yusen, was involved in this research in late 2019, not long before the pandemic hit. And this same scientist, I've discovered, was then the first to invent a vaccine for COVID-19. He filed a patent application and you won't believe this. In June 2021, I broke a story in the Australian newspaper and on my Sky News program that America had funded research by the Chinese military and the Chinese military were working with the Wuhan Institute of Virology and American scientists to genetically manipulate coronaviruses before the pandemic hit. One Chinese military scientist, Zhou Yusen, had a long history of working with Shi Zheng Li from the Wuhan Institute. And Zhou is actually listed as the lead inventor on the patent that was lodged by the Academy of Military Sciences of the PLA for a COVID-19 vaccine. This was in, in February 2020, just five weeks after China had even admitted that COVID-19 was capable of human-to-human -human transmission and he had already developed a vaccine for it. As far back as 2004, this PLA-trained scientist had been experimenting with spike proteins in coronaviruses. That's the point of their infectivity that's often subject to manipulation and gain-of-function research. And then I made another discovery. In an extraordinary twist, Zhou died in mysterious circumstances a couple of months later. He was 54 years old. Actually, one of the things that I uncovered um, and, and reported on is that China had developed a vaccine by February 2020, and it was one of their military scientists, Zhu Yusen, 
He'd been working with Shi Zheng Li at the Wuhan Institute of Virology for years, military scientist, and he was the first person in the world to lodge a patent for a COVID-19 vaccine in February 2020. Does that indicate to you that they knew they were dealing with a problem well before they admitted it to the WHO? It could. I mean, I've seen your reporting on that. Again, it's not something that, you know, I could verify or confirm or, or address. But, um, but you know, again, uh, assuming that's the case, it would just be, you know, if you needed more information to come to a conclusion that China was a bad actor, that would be another piece of information that would be compelling. I don't need any more information. I was convinced a long time ago about how this... Uh, you know, a uh, virus came to be a pandemic on, on the world, and, and I'm convinced that it was because of, there was a lab leak at the Wuhan Institute of Virology, uh, and I knew that, you know, based on intelligence that I'd seen that originated even before, you know, the time frame you're talking about. Intelligence that originated before the time frame? Well, looking back, from, from what I've seen, the intelligence that I'd seen from 2019 and early 2020 was, and, and the Chinese Communist Party's actions were enough to convince me, you know, what was happening at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. When you, when you look at all of that, the aggregate of that intelligence together, what, um, you know, and even what's in the public domain right now, I think it makes the most compelling case, especially when on the other side of the, equ the equation, Sherry, there isn't, any, there isn't any intelligence or evidence at this point. Again, I go back to the World Health Organization's own report about scientific data or intelligence that supports that this was naturally occurring and um, and there isn't any. Well, just on that point, well, just on that point, have you seen any evidence that China has even searched for an animal host or intermediary host? Uh, I, uh, I don't know that I can say one way or the other whether I have. As in it would be classified? Right. I still want to find out what else Ratcliffe knows about Zhou Yusen, that military scientist. A anything about the circumstances in which he died? He, he, he died mysteriously in May 2020. Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, you know, I, I do know that that is a matter that, you know, should and is being investigated um, to the extent that it would be relevant in, in um you know, tying this to origins of, you know, the origins of COVID. So it's being looked at. I do know that or has been looked at. Do you know the conclusion? I wouldn't be able to say. I mean, because I first reported that um, and I found that even though he was this decorated military scientist, he was the lead inventor on the COVID-19 vaccine a patent, and yet he died and there were no tribute articles to him, which would be highly unusual for such a, a decorated CCP figure. Right. Yeah, sometimes reporting like yours actually comes to the intelligence community and, and it's something that then subsequently um, there's further investigation and, and there's a, you know, a determination made about whether or not there's veracity to that or anything if there are intelligence sources that can you know, shed further light on it. So sometimes that's where our best intelligence comes from, is from independent reporting that isn't picked up from human sources that we have or signals intelligence that we have, digital, you know, um, entrees into, you know, um, adversaries. There are Wuhan Institute of Virology workers who were at the facility at the time of the window of that outbreak who are now on U.S. soil. Have they been interviewed? Have they cooperated? I wouldn't be able to say. One of them is uh, Zhu Yusen's wife. Yeah, I wouldn't be able to say. Earlier in this podcast, we've looked at how the scientific and media establishment didn't want to believe this virus could have come from a Chinese laboratory. And parts of the intelligence community didn't want to believe it either. The question is why? Did the intelligence community rely on conflicted and compromised scientists, people like Peter Dajak, who'd been working with the Wuhan Institute of Virology for some 15 years, to form the basis of its view, of the intelligence community's view, that this was a natural virus? Well, when we, when we talk about views um, and we talk about uh, the opinions of the intelligence community, it's degrees of confidence, and, and that can change as new intelligence comes in. 
And so, you know, it was, there was nothing initially to indicate why all of these scientists with, with the World Health Organization and with certain, you know, here in the United States and, and around the world, why they would be giving, you know, inaccurate information out about or statements publicly about, you know, the origins and, and how this, you know, uh, virus uh, spread around the world. But over time, as you compare that with intelligence that comes in, and, and that's not a, a linear equation either, Sherry. In other words, you know, you never know when you're going to get certain intelligence, certain bits of information, certain sources that come through, and as you compare it. But at some point in time, and certainly once I, when I became the director of national intelligence, it just simply didn't match up with what we had and what we were gathering at that point in time. And that's why, if you notice, the opinion of the intelligence community has changed as the opinion of others have changed. Even Dr. Fauci and others have, have, have changed their positions and statements about you know, certain aspects of, the, of COVID-19 and its transmissibility and, and all of those different things. There was a, a National Academy of Sciences meeting. This was before you were in the role as Director of National Intelligence. This meeting was on the 3rd of February, 2020. It was attended by the ODNI, by the FBI, Home Affairs, uh, and others in the intelligence community, along with, uh, along with uh, the National Academy of Sciences. The scientists who were invited to brief the intelligence agencies at this meeting, and this has been made public, Peter Daszak, Christian Anderson, Ralph Barrick, who did gain a function research with Xi Zheng Li, Stanley Perlman. Fauci gave a 10-minute presentation at it. We now know how conflicted some of these scientists were. Why was the intelligence community taking advice from people like Ralph Barrick and Peter Daszak? Well, I don't know if they were taking advice. They were looking at the statements that, they were, that were being made, and I do think that, unfortunately, those uh, statements from, at the time, reputable uh, members of the scientific community, um, you know, can have an influence on on the impressions of people that were in the intelligence community at the time. But again, you ultimately have to look at the intelligence that you that you gather, and and at some point in time, you know, and that's you know, I know from the time that I was there, we really felt like this didn't match up, and so that's why you know w we sort of changed um, the commentary about what was. Uh, what we were understanding about what happened in Wuhan and, and why it changed. And I, I think that's appropriate. Um, again, you know, the intelligence community doesn't presume the best or worst about anyone. And they look at the scientific community and they look at international organizations and they didn't have anything immediately that uh, countered some of this specifically. And again, the intelligence community is not a bunch of scientists. Um, you know, people that analyze and gather intelligence, um, you know, do exactly that. And so, you know, I think it was okay for it to take some period of time. I think at the end of the day, you know, I, I wish that those folks had been more straightforward and honest, um, you know, about the things that they were telling the public because it, it did result in, uh, you know, damages and loss of life. There was conflicting advice, though. The advice from the Lawrence Livermore Laboratories was that this could have been a lab origin. Right. Well, I mean, when it comes to China, there is also, you know, a political narrative that comes to, it comes to play. So there are a lot of folks out there that don't want China to be the bad guy. There are economic reasons and political reasons. And within organizations, uh, both inside the United States and outside, people aren't always honest about China. And in fact, even within the U.S. intelligence community, and this is very public, so I can talk about it, but I felt like that like we weren't looking fairly and accurately at at, uh, at intelligence as it related to China. And so the independent um, ombudsman for our intelligence community came in and agreed with me and said that some of the China intelligence was being suppressed and not reported for political reasons. So, so that can happen. And, you know, uh, I hope in this case that didn't delay, you know, what was an appropriate response, um, you know, from the intelligence community. Um, you know, all you can do is see what's in front of you and address the problem. And, and I think that, you know, it's why I do so much talking about, you know, you may not want China to be the bad guy, but look at their actions, not just with respect to COVID, but with respect to human rights around the world, with respect to how they treat intellectual property, so many different things, territorial claims, why they are a bad international actor that can't be trusted and why we, you know, from an intelligence perspective should be uh, suspicious always about what they're doing. That must have been quite tough for you personally, coming in to uh, lead 
17 intelligence agencies finding that there was this attitude of suppressing information related to China uh, when you wanted the agencies to have a laser-like focus on getting to the bottom of what caused this pandemic that was costing so many lives globally. How much resistance did you have? Well, they're great folks in the intelligence community, so don't take my comments as, you know, as a criticism across the board. But like in any organization, you have people that are going to be you know, politically motivated and, um, and there are political narratives. And, and you know, the focus had been so much on a- actors like Russia and, and adversaries like you know, Russia and Iran. And, and really, um, you know, I, I really, as I looked at the intelligence, I'd say, why is our reporting not reflecting what China is doing here? And, you know, it, you know, it, it took a while to, to bring a focus to that, but I'm glad that I did. I, I'm fr- frankly grateful for the opportunity. And I think that, you know, as a result, the intelligence community is in a better place. And, you know, when I talked about and did something that directors of national intelligence never do, I wrote an op-ed saying China is our number one national security threat. Um, you know, a lot of people didn't like that at the time, but now everyone pretty much agrees with me. And when you hear people talk about China, they concede that they're the number one national security threat to the United States and, and, and other countries around the world, or at least Western uh, and democracies around the world. I suppose in, a, in an odd way, this is one of the only positive outcomes of the pandemic is that we've all been able to see very clearly China's intentions, because not only did they deliberately cover up the virus, resulting in the deaths around the world, exacerbating the spread of the virus, but they then sought to take strategic advantage of it as well. And and particularly here in Australia, where we're on the front line of this, you know, the the economic coercion, the punishment just for calling for an investigation into the origins of the virus. Right. Well, you know, we see that this virus is continuing to cause damages, continuing to cause you know, loss of life and, you know, wrecking economies um, around the world. And the consequences of this are going to continue for some period of time, which is why it's so important, even now as a former director of national intelligence, I'm still talking honestly but forcefully about who China is and what they have done, because there has to be accountability at the end of the day for, for this great tragedy, the greatest tragedy of our lifetimes, and hopefully the worst that we'll ever see on a global scale. China is responsible, and as history reflects over time, you know, people will run from the idea that this was naturally occurring, and, and more people will agree that, you know, what happened in Wuhan happened at the Wuhan Institute of Virology, and, you know, um, and, you know I think that's important because we do need to hold China accountable, uh, not just for this, but for the many things that they're doing around the globe. All right, well, let's return to the Chinese narrative then. John Ratcliffe, from your position as the Director of National Intelligence, was there an active Chinese disinformation campaign? Yes, absolutely. Um, As there typically is with the Chinese Communist Party, with respect to anything that would reflect negatively on China, its government, um, you know, how it's uh, conducting its affairs. Um, And so... There was disinformation campaign from the beginning with respect to um, the origins of, of COVID. And I think, you know, we've, we've talked a little bit about some of the things that they did immediately, you know, to, to cover up, to refuse access, to, you know, shut down, um, you know, travel from Wuhan, all of these different things that they could um, try and, at the end of the day, not have this virus connected to China or China blamed for this virus when it's really, you know, irrefutable and not debatable at this point in time that the Wuhan virus came from Wuhan and and exactly how is less and less uncertain every day as well. Is this why China runs such strong influence and infiltration operations globally, specifically to prepare for a mishap or an accident like this, like a virus escaping from a laboratory? Yes. I mean, what China wants to do is be in a position, if something like this happens, to control the narrative through disinformation, through social media influence campaigns, through pressure on government officials and international organizations so that they can um, create a narrative that is helpful to China and that does not reflect negatively on China and the Chinese Communist Party. And that's exactly what happened here. I mean, China acted differently 
Um, you know, we don't know exactly whether or not this virus would have been contained within China, but we know it would have been um, minimized. We know that our response would have been better. We know we would have been better prepared, and we know that we would have gotten the vaccines that were uh, capable of treating it sooner. And so all of those things make China, the Chinese Communist Party and its officials, specifically a proximate cause of the damages, both the economic damages and the loss of life that happened here. When Donald Trump and Mike Pompeo said they had enormous evidence to support a lab leak in April 2020, did they have that evidence? There was compelling evidence at that point in time that related to circumstances at the Wuhan Institute of Virology that were consistent with that, that it being the origins of this virus. Um, you know, with respect to intelligence and when it comes in, even when it comes in, you know, for instance, if it has to be translated, you know, from Mandarin, if it's, you know, from a particular source that can take a period of time, it doesn't always happen in real time with regard to your question about um, intelligence and when we have it. So sometimes we have intelligence, but we don't know the significance of it for weeks or months later until someone tasked with sort of mining through it and putting it together from whatever source we have um, really identifies it and highlights it and says this is worthwhile intelligence. Why wasn't that compelling evidence that Pompeo and Trump were looking at, why wasn't it shared with the American public? Well, ultimately it was. I think that some of the intelligence I think that, that, um, that they were looking at was part of what we did ultimately declassify and, and made the decision um, to put out in January of 2020. Dr. Tedros had a very close relationship with China, uh, and this was crucial in the virus spreading globally because the WHO made a number of misleading statements. They insisted there was no human-to-human -human transmission. They advised against travel restrictions when the United States, Australia, and New Zealand implemented them uh, at the end of January. Do you think Tedros and his, do you think Tedros was beholden to China and did he have a financial relationship with the Communist Party? Uh, I don't know. I wouldn't comment on it if I did know um, because of where I would have gained that information. But what I can say is that do I think he was compromised by the Chinese Communist Party officials? Was he pressured? Was he influenced? Absolutely. The intelligence very clearly reflects that. And I think we've, we've said that, that World Health, Organi uh, World Health Organization officials, including Dr. Tedros, um, they acted badly. They were influenced by the Chinese Communist Party to do things that were inconsistent with what the World Health Organization is committed, what its mission says it will do. And as a result, they delayed a worldwide response to what ultimately became a pandemic. They contributed to it. Obviously, the Chinese Communist Party and its actions, you know, is the primary proximate cause of the damages. But the World Health Organization, and it's one of the reasons their actions were um, complicit with the Chinese Communist Party at the time, and it's one of the reasons why the Trump administration pulled out of the World Health Organization was because of the things that we discovered from an intelligence standpoint um, they had done in response to pressure from the Chinese Communist Party. Okay, well, let's go back into a bit more detail about what happened at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. The way, the way I've approached uh, looking at the origins of the virus when I was uh, writing my book is that I thought there were two parts to this puzzle. There's the science of SARS-CoV-2 and the unusual features of the virus itself. And then there was the suspicious activity that was happening at the Wuhan Institute of Virology in that window from September 2019. You know, is this the right approach? Is this the way you approached the puzzle when you were as uh, Director of National Intelligence? It, it is the right way because, you know, there is the scientific question and, and, you know, from the intelligence community standpoint, we looked at what certain scientists were saying, matching it with intelligence, and when it didn't match up, we were questioning it. But then we were, as we looked more closely at the Wuhan Institute of Virology, you know, what a lot of scientists like Dr. Fauci and Peter Daszak were saying was, there's no live bats there, there's no um, gain-of-function research there, there's no military there. And we had intelligence that was telling us that all of those things were occurring there. So we realized at that point in time, as we drilled down, that 
Um, you know, the scientists, at least these particular scientists in the community, may have other reasons that they're making some of the statements that they were, just as World Health Organizations who are being pressured and bullied by China um, to say certain and say and uh, do certain things that they had done. And, um, and that's so it was important. And, and as we've talked about, there is no explanation for the suspicious activity there other than to point to the fact that China was doing something that they shouldn't have been doing with respect to bat coronaviruses. Yeah, if, if true, it would be significant. Again, it would be another um, circumstance that would be difficult to explain other than there was a problem that the Chinese Communist Party was aware of and was trying to deal with before uh, you know, it became an outbreak that was public and then ultimately a pandemic that affected every single person on the planet. And, and that's why, you know, as we look back at what China was doing and what they were aware of and what we know, you know, it's important to call them out because, you know, we, we could have had four or five months more perhaps in terms of working towards a vaccine, you know, based on the timeline that you've laid out, had you know, officials in the Chinese Communist Party been honest with the world, had officials with the World Health Organization been honest with the world initially. Just getting back to the intelligence about the sick with workers, the Wuhan Institute of Virology workers for a moment, when this became a big issue under the Biden administration, uh, the White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki said that this was intelligence from a foreign government. And she was unable, therefore, to determine the veracity of it. Is that the case? Uh, we do get intelligence. We share with um, countries like Australia, our Five Eye partners, and others um, intelligence. We, as a as a worldwide community, um, share information about COVID nineteen and origins. Um, I don't recall, as we put that together, whether the the source of that information, whether it was what we would call a third party partner. Uh, to the intelligence community specifically, but I am certain about the veracity of the information. And and the the when we look when we talk about intelligence, Sherry, it comes from a source or method. And uh, when Mike Pompeo and I looked at the information that went out in the fact sheet, um, we had a high level of confidence about the information that we were putting out there because we knew that reporters uh, would look at it and publicly try and verify and confirm that. And we wanted them to be able to do that. And so we put our credibility on the line. So, you know, and I think, again, there has been reporting that um, has confirmed, I think, every aspect of what we put out in that State Department fact sheet that I cleared. Look, one of the other major revelations in your declassified intelligence was the fact that the Wuhan Institute of Virology was working so closely with the Chinese military on secret classified projects. Why were they doing this work? Well, we, we speculate about that. We know that, you know, China has, unlike the United States, China, um, you know, we believe has an offensive bioweapons program. Um, Gain-of-function research w- could be conducted in, in connection with that. Um, you know, so that's about as much as I could say about, about why. But again, Sherry, you know, go back to the... to to what some of the scientists were saying about that this was strictly a civilian lab and strictly civilian research taking place there. And when they were making those statements, we were looking and, and you know, we had intelligence that reflected that obviously we've put out that, that proves that that was not true. And so, again, that was another factor that we knew that some of what folks in the scientific community was was being you know, was biased in some way or incorrect in, in some way. And um, So I think that was one of the important factors. Do you think COVID-19 is a bioweapon or was created during vaccine development for a bioweapon? I don't know that anybody has enough intelligence to make that uh, assessment right now. Um, I'm certainly not in a position to say, I think we've looked at, when I was there, the possibilities of that and what was consistent, but we didn't want to stretch our credibility. We've talked about the different kinds of programs that the Chinese Communist Party has, and and an offensive bioweapons program is one that we have a high confidence exists. Whether this was an accidental lab leak with something that was for gain-of-function research to just 
um, you know, uh, we're not certain, and I'm not going to speculate, and I don't have to because, you know, the consequences here, regardless of whether this was an accidental leak or not, really none of that obviates the fact that that what China did after that fact um, was criminal in nature, in in the sense of that it was a cover up that that caused you know. Uh, a global pandemic wreaked havoc on worldwide economies um, and killed millions and millions of people, and they're responsible for that because of the cover-up, whether this was accidental or not, whether it was intentional or not. I, I completely agree with you. They have, in a sense, you could argue, deliberately killed millions of people because they chose not to shut down Wuhan from the rest of the world and, and even objected to travel bans, as did the WHO. But I do think it is important to ascertain whether the virus was developed as part of an offensive bioweapons program, we've seen what an unusual virus it is, what a contagious, what a deadly virus it is, how it wreaks havoc on the human body, how it behaves so unlike other viruses we've seen that, that initially scientists didn't think there could be asymptomatic spread, you know, where, and yet this virus is capable of that. Uh, I agree with that completely, and I think that's why, you know, the intelligence community now should be focused on that. Look how far we've come in terms of what we um, have put out there and the change in terms of what people thought this virus was at the beginning versus where it is now based on the information, the intelligence that we have declassified. That's why I want to put out as much as possible because China's not going to be helpful in giving us these answers, and the world deserves to know and I think we can get there. I just don't know at this point anyone could conclusively, um, you know, you can certainly speculate. It's certainly a possibility. Um, but I don't know if anyone has enough intelligence at this point to know with any degree of confidence whether or not that's really what China was intending. But it's certainly a possibility and we should find out. So it's possible this virus was part of a bioweapons program? It's possible. I'm not saying that it was, but... It, you certainly can't rule it out based on, you know, the information and intelligence that's been put out there and the fact that how China has, a, has acted and how they're not willing to cooperate with the international community. Uh, again, uh, you know, almost, no, you know, there's almost nothing more compelling than, than China's actions in covering this up and their, you know, refusal to cooperate with international, you know, governments and organizations um, to get honest answers about this because they don't want those answers out there. And, and so that raises the suspicion and why you have to presume, um, you know, some of the worst possible um, scenarios. And just on the question of an accidental leak versus a deliberate move, what's your view? You know, based on what I have seen, I, with, a, with a high degree of confidence, what I have said is I feel it's almost a certainty at this point that the virus came from the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Um, I haven't seen anything specifically that would give me a high level of confidence that it was intentional uh, in the sense of that it was released intentionally. So, you know, if I had to say just from this again as an opinion, I'm not giving you intelligence. My opinion is that there was an accidental lab leak um, uh, at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. But what I say with confidence and with almost certainty is that it did come from the Wuhan Institute of Virology. And I think the intelligence points squarely to that. And what do you think happened? In terms of how the accident, well, lab leaks happen. I mean, th there are other um, you know, viruses, uh, you know, that have, um, you know, caused damages in certain circumstances because there are leaks around labs that work with dangerous viruses. So, you know, the, the mechanics of, of how this, you know, um, spilled out, if you will, or, be, you know, uh, became an accident, I, I don't know. Um, and, uh, you know, you know, hopefully we'll have in better intelligence that gives us concrete answers. We speculate about so much. We have good intelligence, but we don't have answers to everything. And, you know, we inform our opinions based on what we see. And, you know, again, what I do say with confidence and with some degree of certainty is, you know, you know, from, from my perspective that, that it did come from the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Look, just bearing this conversation that we've just had in mind, I just want to read you a sentence from 
the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, a statement that was released um, from the ODNI on April 30 last year, just before you were sworn in. They released a statement that said, the intelligence community also concurs with the wide scientific consensus that the COVID-19 virus was not man-made or genetically modified. That's a false statement, isn't it? It's an incorrect statement. Um, when I came in there, it was one of the first things I asked about. And to that point, you know, this is consistent with what Dr. Fauci said in, in April and May about this, um, about this virus. But where's the intelligence that um, is consistent with that? And that's why, you know, from that point forward, I, when I came in in May of 2020, you started to hear a, a different narrative because the intelligence was different. And, and, and based on what we've declassified, that, that very clearly, is, from my perspective, is not an accurate statement. It's inconsistent with the intelligence that, that I've seen and that you've seen that has been declassified and publicly reported on and confirmed now. Is this an indication of the politicization of parts of the intelligence community? I don't know that it is. I mean, uh, there is politicization in any organization. I've talked about the fact that within the intelligence community, there were people that didn't want there to be uh, China to be perceived as the bad guy. But across the board, I think early on, um, you know, there was, um, you know, people took the scientific community at their word. And until there was enough intelligence that was inconsistent with that word, they didn't want to challenge it. And, you know, and opinions change, intelligence changes, um, confidence levels change, and I think it changed, you know, appropriately. I like to think that the, the actions that we took once, once I came in the position and we sort of focused on this issue and the things that we declassified have given people a better, more clear, more accurate, the world a more accurate view of really what happened in Wuhan. When Pompeo's team in the Arms Verification and Control Bureau, the ABC guys, we're looking into this, Tom DeNano and David Asher, both of whom I've interviewed extensively and repeatedly. They met resistance as well, both within the intelligence agents they would deal with, they were dealing with, but also within the State Department. Uh, famously, in one meeting, officials said to them, Don't go there, you'll open up a can of worms. David Asher and Tom DeNano have told me they took this to mean don't start looking into America's gain-of-function research and the research America was funding in Wuhan. Was a part of this attitude from the intelligence community and other officials, do you think this was in any way attempting to cover up America's involvement in this research? I think there were uh, scientists um, that we've talked about that um, had been engaged in this type of research and had been involved with the Wuhan Institute of Virology directly that certainly didn't want this to be the narrative. There were officials at the World Health Organization that you know, knew that they had been pressured by the Chinese Communist Party to do things that they later had to backtrack on and that their position has changed. So I think that it, it really had more to do with, with, with those people um, uh, you know, want, not wanting to be responsible for what became a worldwide pandemic that has killed millions. And, you know. And they were influencing, they were influencing the intelligence community. I, I think so. I mean, I think that that, you know, um, uh, I think that's entirely accurate, that, that there were folks that were doing that. They were making statements publicly that simply weren't true. And, and it, it was incumbent on us as the intelligence community to come up with intelligence that reflected whether or not that was the case, and we proved that it was not true. The ODNI was set up after September 11 specifically to prevent another, another September 11-style attack. The threats of bio-research from China were not heeded well enough within the American scientific community. Do you think this has been a failure of the intelligence community? I, I don't. I mean, the the in, it again. The role of the intelligence community, um, when it comes to public health issues, you've identified the organizations and the entities that are responsible for stopping pandemics. The role of the intelligence community isn't to do that. It's to gather information and inform policymakers. Now, whether or not 
um, enough intelligence was was gathered. You know, you can have that opinion whether, but the, but the role of you know pandemics and warning the world of pandemics. That's what the World Health Organization is for. That's that's the purpose behind it. Of course, but a pandemic caused if if this has been caused by a laboratory leak by an offensive bioweapons program, if that is the case, even if it is accidental, you know, that should have been an intelligence warning to the NIH and to other health authorities who were pouring money into this specific research. I mean, why is America even funding research in with Chinese institutions that are working with the military? Right. Well, I mean, there are folks that should answer that question, not from an intelligence standpoint, but from a policy standpoint. I mean, regardless of what happened in Wuhan, you know, increasingly China has been um, a national security threat to, you know, not just the United States, but, but democracies around the world for some period of time. And I do think, again, that, um, uh, that there are political and economic reasons, both in the United States and outside the United States, where people have not wanted to look fairly and accurately at the threat that China is. And I think that that has played a role with respect to that. And I think, you know, part of what you said is true, that coming out of this, it's harder and harder for people to defend China and the things that China um, has done, not just with respect to COVID, but with respect to human rights, with respect to territorial claims, with respect to aggression around the world, all of those things being a bad international um, actor. You know, a lot of people now say that the lab leak theory wasn't taken seriously, that it was dismissed as a conspiracy theory because of Donald Trump. But in fact, Donald Trump didn't say that there was evidence that the virus came out of a lab until April 2020. It was mid-April when Trump and Pompeo said that they had a high level of confidence and that there was enormous evidence that the virus came from the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Did they have evidence at the time to support the statements that they made publicly? Was there evidence of a, the, of a Wuhan Institute of Virology of a potential problem there? Yeah, we had lots of intelligence. I think we've talked about um, much of that that would have been the basis of those statements. Again, those took place before I became the Director of National Intelligence, um, but there was intelligence that supported you know, having um, some level of confidence at that point in time, you know, as of April of 2020, the most likely scenario from the intelligence standpoint, from my perspective, was the Wuhan Institute of Virology, a lab leak. Um, I think that that was, you know, uh, from an early standpoint, the most likely scenario. And I think it's become more than just a possibility, more than a probability and close to a certainty. They were criticized so roundly at the time for making those statements and not being able to produce any evidence to back that up. Yeah, all the people that made those criticisms have drifted away, and they're not talking about it um, uh, much anymore. There are very few people that are saying that uh, that the COVID, uh, that the lab leak theory is a conspiracy anymore, a conspiracy theory anymore. Um, you know, some of the people that, uh, and I, I think that folks in your business um, some of them are reluctant to write about this now uh, and to give it any credence uh, because it would undermine what they'd previously written and what they'd previously said. And I think there's great pressure on, on news organizations because the evidence is becoming overwhelming that that's exactly what happened, that it's not just a lab leak theory, it was a lab leak. And, um, and I think increasingly over time, Sherry, um, it's going to be harder and harder for anyone to 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 dispute that with any degree of confidence. Well, maybe let's put this on the record that you know the the way that the, the role that the media played in siding with the Chinese Communist Party and promoting Chinese propaganda is extraordinary. Absolutely, I mean, one of the worst actors in terms of protecting China is the corporate media, uh, mainstream media. A number of reasons for that, but uh, you know, in 2020, one of the reasons was the political narrative, and obviously a press that was 93% opposed to uh, negative with respect to Donald Trump um, uh, wanted the focus to be on Russia and what Russia might be doing as opposed to China, um, since China had a preference for Joe Biden uh, to be president, and the intelligence reflected that. I mean, you're right. This all played out. This entire debate about the origins of the virus played out in an election year. 
Trump insisted it came from a lab. The Democrats said it didn't, said that it was a natural virus. From an intelligence perspective, how difficult and how politicized did the environment become when you were trying to investigate what happened in Wuhan? It became very uh, politicized, and specifically Democrats in Congress on Capitol Hill weren't willing to look honestly at the intelligence that, that we were giving them from the intelligence community. Again, you had an independent um, ombudsman look at the issue and say that the intelligence community was suppressing um, some intelligence regarding China because they didn't want it to work to the advantage of Donald Trump. And that was not covered by the media fairly. Uh, political figures, Democrats on Capitol Hill didn't want that to be the case. They didn't want the American public influenced by that. And, um, and so it became very political with respect to uh, intelligence. And, and frankly, a lot of people were not willing to look honestly at the bad things that China was doing, not just with respect to COVID, but with respect to the other things around the world that we've talked about, human rights abuses and otherwise. When Joe Biden did announce a probe into this issue in May this year, he said parts of the intelligence community were leaning towards a natural origin of COVID-19, two parts, and one part uh, was leaning towards a lab leak. Which agencies were more resistant to exploring the laboratory leak hypothesis? I don't know that I'd be in a position to say that any particular agency was, um, um, you know, unduly prejudiced one way or another. There are folks within any... um, in, in different agencies that di- have different, you know, political biases and preferences that somehow come through. And the job of the intelligence community is to try and, you know, weed that out and make sure that it, it doesn't happen. But, you know, my takeaway from Joe Biden's probe in that was was really disrespectful to the intelligence community. He's really trying to make it seem like we hadn't collected enough intelligence to come to a conclusion. That's simply not the case. He's wrong. There was enough intelligence to to say with a degree of confidence that, again, for all the reasons we've talked about, that this uh, virus came from a lab leak or, or came specifically from the Wuhan Institute of Virology when there is no intelligence on the other side of the equation, nothing that supports that this was naturally occurring. No scientific data, no intelligence data, and the World Health Organization now agrees with that. In terms of the specific agencies, though, you know, is this your personal assessment or um, do major bodies like the CIA agree with you? Well, you know, CIA is one of the 17, now 18 intelligence agencies um, uh, that I uh, oversaw. Um, you know, I, there, there are great folks in all of the agencies. I, I'm not, you know, I didn't have a particular problem within the CIA um, with, uh, you know, this particular issue across the board, if that's your question, um, when it came to, you know, uh, research into the uh, origins of COVID. I was just trying to get a sense of which agencies were more resistant to this, given Joe Biden said two parts still think it's a natural virus and one part thinks it's a lab leak. You know, was there any particular divide in, in among the agencies? No, not with respect to, you know, agencies as a whole. Individuals within each individual agency, I think, had differences of opinion. And I think in some cases, politics could come into play there. But I don't think the statement by Joe Biden is, uh, you know, I don't think he was being honest and, and truthful um, in his public commentary with respect to that. I think that there, there is increasingly fewer people that support the idea that this was naturally occurring. And within the intelligence community, based on people I talk to every day, increasingly uh, confident that, in fact, it was um, a result of an accident or something intentional at the Wuhan Institute of Virology because the intelligence is frankly overwhelming with respect to that. In terms of finding out specifically and definitively what happened, what accident happened, what would you still need to know? Well, you never know when you're going to get intelligence. We pick it up from, again, different places, and and it's, uh, uh, you know, so uh, you never know when we'll get the specific intelligence. I do feel confident at some point in time, even with the Chinese Communist Party not sharing and trying to, um, you know, prevent us from getting answers, we get more and more information over time. So, Someone within China is going to come out and talk to someone like you and, and, and provide more information. 
or we're going to pick up some signals intelligence from officials who are talking in an international organization or, or with a Chinese official. We're going to get you know, more and more information to where it's going to be harder and harder for anyone to say that there's any explanation other than this came from the Wuhan Institute of Virology. So John Ratcliffe, you know, stepping aside from your position as the Director of National Intelligence, you know, how did you, as, as a human, as a father, as a husband, uh, deal with the pandemic o- over the past 20 months? Not easily, um, just like everyone else on the planet. Um, you know, uh, I never contracted COVID, um, but everyone on the planet knows someone that has. Uh, we've all uh, know someone that has died as a result of it to at least some degree or have been impacted with symptoms that are still occurring. Um, economically, we know people that have lost jobs. Um, it, it's impacted every person on the planet, and it was And it was happening in the time that I was the director of national intelligence. And that was one of the reasons that I was committed to being honest about getting answers, even if they were uncomfortable, even if it made, you know, China the bad guy with folks that didn't want China to be the bad guy. But as we had intelligence that clearly pointed culpability, responsibility, blame to the Chinese Communist Party, its officials, and then other officials like in the World Health Organization, I wanted to be real clear eyed honest, fair, but, but, but forceful in terms of making that clear. And it's why I have conversations like this with you, because I'm, I'm so convinced about where this pandemic uh, came from and who is responsible for it. And, and there's no question in my mind whether I'm talking as the director, former director of national intelligence, a former member of Congress on the Intelligence Committee, or as a private citizen. Is there still major intelligence that goes to proving the virus came out of the Wuhan Institute of Virology that's still not in the public domain? Yes, there's compelling intelligence that hasn't been declassified. We talked about putting more of it out. I'd like to see, at the time we made the determination, we put out as much as we could. We hoped that it would create momentum, um, maybe to have the Chinese be more uh, cooperative with international uh, organizations and with governments. they haven't done that, and so I think the time has come for the Biden administration to declassify additional information that would, again, um, uh, more evidence if you need it, that, that Chinese Communist Party officials acted badly, bullied international officials, um, covered up, um, suppressed um, uh, you know, uh, intelligence and reporting on this. Um, There is more intelligence out there, and I'd like to see it uh, declassified because the Chinese have forced um, our hand on this. Do you regret now that you didn't take that extra step and declassify more? No, because we we really, Mike Pompeo and I and others uh, and some of the folks that you mentioned, we had a lot of conversations about this, about what, you know, was important. But you have to remember at the end of the day, after covid China's still, we need eyes and ears into the Chinese Communist Party and the bad things that they're doing around the world. And so when you declassify intelligence, you, you, you risked, you know, the potential human sources or signals intelligence where your, where your eyes and ears into the, to their actions are coming from. And so we put out as much as we felt we could safely do um, at the time. But I just think that now that more time has gone on and, and China continues to be you know, obstructive with respect to getting answers, we should put additional intelligence out because it'll create additional pressure, not just on Chinese Communist Party officials, but others that still continue to deny that China is a bad actor here. Just finally, do you think we will have a conclusive answer that would convince even the most hardened skeptics about where this virus came from? Um. Well, I hope so, but I don't think we need more than we have. I mean, everyone looking fairly and objectively of what we already have should come to the same conclusion that the most likely most likely scenario is that this originated from the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Uh, you know, more information, more intelligence would be better. I don't think to hold China accountable just based on what we have, even giving them every... Um, benefit of the doubt, their actions were terrible. They were approximate cause, even in the cover-up, regardless of whether or not this was um, accidental or whether or not this occurred in a wet market, they still concealed the transmissibility of it um, and delayed 
you know, a world response to that and, um, and they should be held accountable. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much, John Ratcliffe, for your time. What Really Happened in Wuhan is presented by The Australian. It's written and produced by me, Shari Markson, and The Australian's editorial director, Claire Harvey. It was produced by Liat Samaglu. My book, What Really Happened in Wuhan, is available online at Amazon, in bookstores in Australia at Dimox, or wherever you buy your books. 